Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the virtual launch of Jenny Gunn's book, Permanent Tourists. Before we get started, I'm just going to go over a couple of quick housekeeping things. If you are experiencing any issues during the live stream, if things are freezing or um, all of a sudden you've disconnected, try refreshing the page. That often resolves any issues that you may be experiencing. Um, also, we have links to purchase your copy of Permanent Tourists in the description and also whenever the book cover pops up on screen, just like this. Uh, a link to purchase it will also pop up in the comments, so you can see that there. Um, if you purchase your copy of the book from Massey Books, uh, you will get a signed book plate as part of that. Um, we encourage you to purchase from Massey Books or your favorite local independent bookstore, wherever that may be, and support our indies. Uh, also, we'll be taking questions from the audience at the end, so be sure to start putting in all of those questions in the comments section. We see them there and we'll be able to answer them then. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our host for this evening, Hal. So Hal Wake has been engaged in the literary community in Canada for more than 30 years. In the mid 80s, he was the book producer for the most influential public radio program in Canada, Morningside, with Peter Zosky. He is an honorary member of the Writers Union of Canada, and he is the artistic he was the artistic director of the Vancouver Writers Fest until 2017. So thank you for joining us, Hal, and I'm just going to add Jenny to the screen as well, and then I'll let you guys take it away. Thank, thank you, Ashley. Obviously, we can't do this without Jenny, so <laughs> welcome. Hey. Um, <clears throat> and uh, my challenge as the host of this, because you guys are going to supply a lot of the questions, um, although I have more than enough to last us, we have about an hour. But my biggest challenge is how to introduce somebody who is a dear friend without sounding all squishy. But I'm going to give it my best shot. <laughs> Perhaps best known for her formidable backyard bocce skills, <laughs> Jenny's also been an accomplished and valued touring musician, teacher, translator, active union member, and writer. So she's had a hand in so many different projects. Her books of poetry, short fiction, and novels have been translated into Dutch and Italian and won awards here and abroad. And of course, the new book that we're celebrating tonight, today, wherever you are, is called Permanent Tourists. Hello, Jenny. Hello. So weird that we're about two miles from each other, but we're we worlds apart. It. We should be doing it face to face, but we can't. Well, we are doing it face to face. We are. <clears throat> um, I used a word, squishy, up there, and and I actually checked it in the dictionary, and it is a word. I thought I was kind of making it up, but it is a word. Your book, the first story. First page, I ran into a word I had never heard of in my life. This happens very rarely. If you read a lot, you see a lot of words. The word is stridor. Is that? Oh, yes. That's what crickets do. How do you know? Where did that come from? <laughs> I've heard a lot of crickets. What can I tell you? <laughs> and, you know, crickets, I mean, you. everything has its own, it's the name of the sound of everything, right? It's the sort of collective nouns and sounds of noise. I, you know, but like, what do crows do? Do they, they don't do strider. Do you, do you research that stuff? Because um, there's a, an evident uh, joy in, in language that you're, you show here in the book. You know, I, I, I would say, I, I certainly research all sorts of things, but I think also that, um, Partly because I have Italian as a background, you know, the Latin background, there are so many words that um, that are not it's so much in use in English, but they are to me. They're very familiar because they, they sound like the Italian word. right? They're the beginning of the Italian word. So so maybe maybe that's part of it that I, I, I hear the word in my head and then I go, oh, is that a word here? But yeah, actually, I have to tell you and Karen, the my 
lovely, wonderful publisher editor is here. And she, she, I had used the word Strider, I think, probably three times in the collection. And, and I saw it twice. <laughs> and she's very, very, very rightfully said no. <laughs> you can't use it three there times. There are too many Striders. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true when you use an unusual word, you don't really want to reuse it more than once or maybe. No. no. <laughs> At that point, it becomes, yeah, yeah. overkill. <laughs> uh, let's dive right into, the, into okay. the book. The title comes from a P.K. Page poem, um, our dearly beloved, wonderful P.K. Mm -hmm. Page, of the same, exact same name. Is there a relationship between the poem and the book? I think so. Yeah, I think I was thinking of permanent tourists in the PK page poem. The permanent tourists are people who are touring around to new places, new things, standing in front of monuments, having their pictures taken without really understanding what the monument is, what the history is, without essentially entering into the experience. It's very superficial. And so I was thinking that in this collection that the people in the the characters in the collection are somehow tourists in their own lives as well they're they're not willing to enter totally into the experiences and sometimes they're even going off to other places as if somehow um they can get a better life there where in fact it, 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 you don't get a better life right so so in that sense yeah i was thinking of it as a kind of not entering the experience, perhaps, yeah. Um, I, I read a, a quote about the poem that says, P.K. Page explores the contradictory identity of those without identity. And I read this mm. towards, yeah, to, you know, after I made finished most of the stories, reading most of the stories, and things clicked into place because I I did get, not sidetracked, but preoccupied perhaps by the, the whole travel and tourist aspect. But in fact, I mean, these characters in the interlinked stories um, are generally in a crisis of identity. They're trying to explore why they are the way they are. Wait. I think that's true. Yeah, I think I think that is true. And it's funny that you say that because um, a lot of people have said that uh, that a lot of my work is about identity, right? And uh -huh. and I wonder if that has to do with the fact that I'm an immigrant, and so you know, there's that somehow not not conscious, but somehow within you know you're straddling cultures constantly you're straddling two different cultures you're str but mm -hmm. and in my case i travel a lot so i'm straddling a lot of other cultures as well and and comfortable everywhere though i have to say i don't, I don't feel like that way but i think i think you're right i think the characters are they're all having a crisis about yeah. Who, who they are in this particular place what who are they how did they get here in in that in that sense yeah yeah why don't um we have a little reading you've you've prepared something um and you're i don't see you anymore <laughs> is it me who so has jenny disappeared can I get a little direction from there? Uh, oh. Sorry, uh, it appears that Jenny has uh, disappeared. Hopefully she'll be able to join us in just a second. I'm guessing she's having a little bit of technical issues on her end. While we're waiting for Jenny, um, people should be putting their comments, um, the, their questions that they have for Jenny when she joins us in the comments section. Uh, so we can be sure to answer those later on this evening. Um, uh. 
let me just check. Um, There's Jenny. Okay, let's add her back. Okay. There we go. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but um, I'm just going to read a little piece from um, this is a story. Just the setup is a there's a young woman who has been um, her mother has died and she is on her own in the house in Vancouver and she has really never lived alone. So she's outside, um, I guess around Spanish banks. She's outside on the beach. On the beach now in Vancouver, a red sun low on the horizon was reflected in the multiple windows of the downtown skyscrapers, creating a burning cathedral. The splash startled her. She turned. A man rose slowly out of the waves, a black masked figure, trails of seaweed on his back. Water dripped, splashed, trilled, spouted, bled, wept, trickled onto sand. She drew in her, her breath. It couldn't be. Her heart beat frantic rhythms in her chest. She got up and raced home, locked the door, closed all the windows and secured them. Then she went up to her bedroom and looked out. In the twilight, she could just discern the man on the sand. He had shed the top half of his wetsuit so that it hung like a second skin around his waist. Behind him, partly in water, was his windsurfer, its blue sails floating on the water's surface. She sighed and let out a small laugh. She was being ridiculous. She unlatched the windows and breathed in. Downstairs, a few moments later, when she opened the door, he stood dripping on the wooden porch, his rubber mask dangling around his neck. I couldn't help noticing, he said. He shifted foot to foot as if trying to keep warm in the blue water sandals, his skin chafed red in the January air. Back there, she stared at him, listening to the water drip off his wetsuit into the depressions in the porch where water clustered, forming a glass harmonica of chromatic runs, pentatonic scales, minor modes, a dissonance. I frightened you, he said. I'm sorry. She took a deep breath back to herself. No, no, it, it was nothing. An error, that's all. I mistook you for someone. She ran a hand through her hair, aware she must look disheveled. He smiled. I heard your mother died, he said. She frowned. How did he know? Why, why was he here? Should she close the door and throw the latch? Her hand slid around the doorknob. I'm sorry. His eyes were black and avoided hers. Yes, no, thank you, an accident. She flipped on the porch light overhead and he was silhouetted against the violet sky. Well, you're sure you're okay? His head now craned around hers. His eyes stared past her into the living room. What was he seeing? What, what was he looking for? My father should be here any moment, she lied, trying to keep her voice from trembling. It's awfully cold out here, he said, his voice confidential. My windsurfer's broken and my car's way off at Third Beach. I'm sorry, she said, and began closing the door when his foot stepped in. Would you mind if I used your phone to call a friend to come and get me? He smiled. Too late. She saw her mistake. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot of um, tension in the book, isn't there? Dramatic. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of a perfect Halloween book, if you think about it. <laughs> Little shivery things of people. Little shivery things. Spirits. <laughs> Um, we've got questions pouring in, I would say. It's going to take me a minute to um, uh, go through them. So I'll ask you one more question, and then uh, we'll perhaps end up weaving back and forth. But um, my last question for now is the um, deliberate interconnection of the stories. I mean, and, and this, of course, is, is a technique and a, uh, an approach that... Uh, various writers have used. Why did you decide that you wanted the, the characters to overlap and interweave in and out of the stories? I thought about, I think partly is that I just thought they were all connected. I mean, 
I guess I should say, so when I'm writing stories, I'm, you know, I rarely, this is, I guess, my third book of stories, and in, in neither or in any of them, I didn't, uh, did I sit down and go, okay, I'm going to write a short story collection. So the stories uh -huh. tend to, the, in, you know, whereas with a novel, there's a really dis definitive, yeah. And so the stories, you know, accumulate over a couple of years or whatever, where, you know, you write one here, one there, and then... Um, to put them together is that's when I started looking at them and saying, oh my goodness, they are all related by uh, loss, right? They all, these are all people who have lost something and who are searching to either forgive themselves or forget what they've lost or replace what they've lost. And so, um, and, and so in that sense, it started to make sense. I thought, oh, you know, this character is really the character from that story. It's as if subconsciously I had been connecting them without knowing that I was connecting them. So so it was kind of a little magic trick in the end that, that it happened, that they, that it was almost like, as they say, I, I was almost um, surprised myself to discover that these things were fitting together so perfectly. I thought, oh, I guess it's my subconscious knew all along that I was doing this somehow, right? So it wasn't as though you wrote the stories over five years, whatever, however long, and then went back and establish those connections, they were already emerging as you wrote the stories. Well, th yes and no, Bo both of those things, right? But So the, some the of them you had to go back and build a bridge. A, a little bit, but not, not much, because what I found was that it seemed perfectly clear that the character, the minor character of that story was the major character here. Like it made sense that, you, you know, it was like, Oh, that, in fact, at one point I had to do, um, I had to make a timeline to make sure that everything worked, you know, that people weren't suddenly, because there was, there was a moment when I had someone who, you know, was 12 years old in one story and then, you know, 32 it, it, <laughs> when only 10 years had passed or, you know, like I really had to, to consider those types of things, right? But, but, but the core of the stories, I think the core of the characters seem to be um, inherently there. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, that's so amazing. It, it was actually kind of, it, it was really exciting and, and kind of astounding doing it, yeah. All right, first question is from Anne Giardini. Hello, Anne. Can't see you, but we know you're there. Hi, Anne. <laughs> uh, she hopes uh, that um, we'll hear from you about how books like Permanent Tourist will fill, fulfill, help fulfill our unmet need for travel. And um, and how you know what real life stories will make Great Britain stories? Hmm. Well, well, what about travel? What about travel? Okay, so I I I do travel a lot. I always have. I've been circling around <laughs> probably Europe and Asia for you know since I was born. Really, I, I started when I was a a little child going up and down Italy. So, um, so travels, travel's been a very comfortable place for me. And of course, while traveling, you always discover weird things you come across as, for example, um, in, and you'll see that the kernels of these things in the stories, you know, I came across, we were in Cambodia and there was a man being stoned for goodness sake. So, um, you know, I, built an entire story out of it that you actually saw that I did actually see that yeah that little piece and then the rest of the story is completely made up but that that thing you know was well it's it, some of these incidents ca ask cause a question to be asked in that in the case of that particular story the the question was you know what obviously it's fear that's making people want to throw stones at someone who is so disadvantaged and so i kept thinking what there but maybe maybe we're all capable of throwing that stone if we're afraid enough and so i knew that i had to write a story that ended with us with the someone picking up a stone right so then i had to figure out what that was going to be but i was that was the thought behind 
um, seeing that little incident and then that grew into a much longer story, right? Yeah. So I said, yeah. Um, next question from Linda. You talk about how the core of the uh, characters were there from the beginning. When you write, uh, oh, there you go. When you write a story, what comes first? Character, situation, let me add one more thing, place. Play, because there are those writers who everything's about place. There are those, everything's about character. And then there's you. I would say, I would say that it, I, for me, it's not a set thing. It can be uh, a situation like that stone, for that stoning, that was a situation that happened to also be in place. And the place happened to be filled with, um, you know, historical significance, certainly with genocide, et cetera. So it, the whole thing fit very perfectly with fear, et cetera, et cetera. So there was that. Um, and, and there was, and I, well, I would say character is, is a really important part, right? But generally, I would say, unlike maybe other people, you know, that I've heard describe this, I, I and well, I'm sure there's lots of people do this too, like me, I, I tend to, to know what it is I want to say. So maybe I, I do think about theme somehow, if, you, if we could call that theme. Uh, in other words, I, I, I have an idea of something, like I, just what I said about the, the, the stones, right? It's, the stoning itself was, was the image set, that set yeah. the story going, but um, behind that image, so what would be my, you know, so I could write down the image and then what? So I, so I had to examine what that meant for me. What was it about that stoning that really, really was not beyond the shocking value of it what why was it there what made it and so i so thematically i think it has to connect to something that i'm interested in exploring it's always a question for me writing it's a question about you know what is this why is this what and and trying to come to that yeah and and as horrible, obviously, as the act of, of stoning is, um, you do allow for a cultural expression of of why that mm -hmm. happened, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we hear and and have some, well, if not sympathy, certainly some understanding. Um, yeah. of the because it's different. Yeah, it's different. Yes. It's not wrong. It's just different. And, you know, and I think culture, that's what culture is all about, right? Is people have different beliefs and, you know, who am I to say they're right or wrong? They're just, they're just different. And we, but I think we, there's room for all of them, you know, we can appreciate them all. And they're not necessarily, you know, we're not necessarily going to adopt them, but yeah, we can try to understand them. Yeah. Um, while I look for the next uh, question, yeah. From the um, assembled throngs. We actually don't even know how many people are out there. No, we don't. It's a, but, it's a... But you have so many friends. And the sad thing is that we can't all just... <laughs> I know. It would be lovely to see everybody and you know, have a big party. Although I see from looking on there, I see people who are talking there who are, who are um, actually completely in other sides of the world. Lots of people are saying hello. There's but feel written. <laughs> yeah. Ask ask oh. questions. Okay, so my question, and I don't know quite how to wrestle this one, but um, because you brought up the story about the stoning, and yeah. um, I noted at the back of the book after I had finished stones, I I, I just wrote stones because. I need you to take me farther into understanding this, but there are stones all over, all over. I yeah. mean, touchstones. Um, yeah. There so, are there are two geologists, I think, two or three geologists. Where does this all come from? You know, this was a very subconscious kind of thing, actually. But maybe it is one of my. Um, uh, one of my interests, if you like, obsessions, but it it's to do with it's to do with the fact that the earth, 
you know, the geology of the earth, the earth itself is such a full and incredible metaphor for life, for life, for uh, life as we live it, for all different parts of life, for memory, for you know, all, so it. I just find it's one of the richest places to search, really, for to 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 really describe something like, you know, I think I did use it in there in the, in one of the stories. The idea that the the Ammonite, Ammonites who are, you know, locked inside a crystal, you know, millions of years later, you can open them up and there they are, and somehow they're like memories too right memories that are uncovered in that way that stay hidden or secrets they could be secrets as well so there's something about the earth and the stratification of it i just i see it really really visually to me and and stones are are things that you you have to overcome they're things that are obstacles. They're also um, things that are incredibly beautiful. And some of the stones that I talk about, and certainly in Italy, Italy is huge karst territory. And so, um, in fact, in a town where my aunt lived one year, I was I was visiting, and one of the houses um, actually crumpled, like the living room just disintegrated and went down into one of the caves because it's all you know cars cave underneath yeah. right and so um so there's also that there's this sort of uh this this um, what's the word that i want it stone is solid and then it's also not solid and water can you mm -hmm. know through stone which it seems incredible right but uh so I guess it's my fascination with that and and just and stones work in different ways throughout the the stories as you probably noticed they 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 take on different meanings throughout but they're definite I could have called the collection stones but Timothy Findlay already He did. already <laughs> stole it from you. <laughs> yeah. If he wasn't dead we'd have to give a <laughs> we'd have we'd have to real talking to to Tiff. <laughs> Um, you mentioned earlier uh, travel, uh, that you travel a lot. And anybody who knows you knows, envies, envies your ability to, to um, traverse the world and, and explore different cultures. But you're not, you can't be traveling now. <laughs> no. no. So <laughs> how do you feel that? in any visceral you know, way yeah i do i do you know i i i like the movement you know i like the movement but i do it now just through you know i've kept i've kept journals for about 30 years believe wow. it or not yeah and and so you know i i've I sort of I can go back and look at some of those things that you know, but I guess I'm working right now on a new, on a novel, and so I've moved into the years of that novel. So now I'm I'm researching. I'm doing a lot of researching as I write, and um, you know that's that just has to do for now, right? There's not mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do about it. I miss it though. I miss it a lot. Yeah, and and actually as much as zooming and uh, you know doing all these online events can be really tiresome after a while to watch and to do um the fact is it can it does connect us across the world you yeah. know to to other people and so that's one way of kind of traveling virtually so to speak right yeah yeah but i do miss it i can't wait to go again after my many years of talking to writers i'm careful uh not to conflate the perspectives of the stories with the writer's own views and experiences because quite often what's in a story um may not uh you may not share that perspective in any way whatsoever and it may not have come out of any direct um experience I also, on this happy occasion, uh, don't want to dwell on anything uh, too dark. But there is abuse uh, in in the book, in the in the stories, particularly between uh, older men and 
young women and girls. Uh, what took you to that place? Huh. Well, probably, uh, probably, you know, there is a lot of reality in there, right? I yeah. remember at one Well, uh, uh, the, the, you know, that cult leader has just been sentenced to 125 years exactly. in prison. He could, have been, he could have been someone in this book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Was... Oh, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, you, um, uh, I think you said these things happen. Well, yeah, they do. They happen. And oh, yeah, I know what I was going to say. I was going to say some years ago, I did a, a sort of a an anecdotal survey of all my women friends and asked them all, you know, who 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 could say that they had been in some way molested when they were young women? I mean, underage women. And I don't think there was one who said no. Every single one of them had some experience with an older man. Um, now, I, I hope that these things don't happen today as much, but I'm not sure that they don't, right? So, What are you suggesting about the difference between some unnamed period and today? Um, well, I guess I'm suggesting that we talk about it a lot more now, right? That it's out in the, it, because people do talk about it. And I think parents today um, speak to their children in terms of, you know, your body is your body, you can't do this, you don't, right? You, there, right. There's a lot more awareness in that sense, I think. Whereas um, I think in other generations, they may have hidden that a lot more, right? But I think, I think but I think in a way, though, that there is something else too. And that is that the fact is we, you know, women, young women are also very sexual. We, we don't say that out loud so often, but you know, young women are like young men in a way. They're just, they're discovering their own sexuality and whatever. Hormones. So, yeah, it's hormones, right? And so an older man has such an advantage over that and takes advantage of that. The fact that these young women don't, they don't really know their own bodies. They don't, they don't know. And, um, and I think, you know, I think that is, is an interesting sort of area where it really does require that the older man stop himself, right? They, they, because the young women are also intrigued. And also these are uh, authority figures. And so as, you know, in the book, there's not really any, as you know, there's there's no abuse that's not rape, no. not that kind of abuse, but it no. is. It is still abuse, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of the differences may be if if things are getting better, and I share with you I a, hope so. a real hope uh, that that they are getting better. But um, one of the things that may be changing is the sense of entitlement, uh, <clears throat> particularly within families where um, uncles and fathers and um, perhaps at a t one time felt entitled um, yeah. to uh, take advantage to of. Take advantage, yeah. Yeah. And, well, and, and felt ownership over their children. Right. Ownership in a way that uh, rather than respecting them as separate beings, right? Yeah. I did some research actually on that, especially when that one story that you're probably thinking about. And, um, and I was, I actually did, I looked at a lot of first person accounts and I was astounded by what some of the fathers said, for example, who had abused their daughters or, or yeah, daughters, sometimes sons. Um, very much the attitude was, well, you know, we just thought we owned our children. We didn't, you know, it wasn't. What's what's the yeah. big deal, right? That kind of it was that that was the kind of sentiment. And yeah, I'm sorry now, but you know, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So I mean, it's 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 an interesting thing, right? When you when you look at that and incest and and a lot of cultures still incest is a is a silent thing. You know, mm. people don't just don't discuss it. It's just not to be discussed, right? Here's a question from. Uh, the gathered crowd. Okay. Uh, when I think this is from Shelley, 
um, when you can travel again, where would you like to go? And and maybe let's expand that, play with that a little bit. Um, given that you've traveled a lot in Asia, you're Italian, got Italian roots and friends, you've been on international tribunals in Paris. So, <laughs> so where have you not been that you would I have love not to go? been to Africa. And I would love to go there. And my sister, of course, lived in Africa for many years, different parts of Africa. And, you know, she just adored being there. So I think that I would like to do, to go to someplace in Africa for sure. I don't even know where, but maybe, maybe Zimbabwe, just because it's so beautiful there. Um, and I've always wanted to go to Peru. I oh, want to go yeah. Peru. I want to go see Machu Picchu. Did you read that? I mean, I Machu Picchu has been closed, and they opened it up for, for this one guy. Japanese tourist, <laughs> this young guy who'd been up there for how however I long. Was so envious, you and so he got envious. to go by himself. I know, with a guide, just he and a guide. Is you that know. not every traveler's <laughs> dream? dream. Kick everybody out of the gallery. <laughs> Let me stand in front of the Mona Lisa for an hour if I want. I mean, really, really, you know? Yeah, yeah I read that. I was so envious. He had actually, I think he was there for about six months or something. And then they decided when, when he was finally able to go home, they let him, they took him up because they thought, oh, he's been here for six months. Trapped. Yeah. I don't know. Can you be trapped? You can't be trapped, surely, in Peru. You know, one time... Speaking of trapped, I can tell you a little tiny anecdote. So um, when I was teaching uh, at Quantman, I was teaching creative writing, and and uh, one of the students, in, it was a short story class, and, and one of the students had written a story about uh, about a, a boy, 19-year-old boy, 18 or 19, who had been, who had an uncle whose father, whose father's brother lived in Paris. And this uncle had invited the young boy to come and, and spend the summer in Paris and work there. And and so the, the the character in the story says, oh, no, no, he doesn't want to go to Paris. And so I <laughs> found this so extraordinary, <laughs> even though it was his story. I, I said to him, so I don't understand. Why, why wouldn't he want to go to Paris? You know, he's got a job there, a place to stay. And he said to me, what if he gets stuck in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> That's always stuck with me, right? <laughs> what if get stuck in Paris? So I, when this Peru thing happened, when this I heard about this uh, this traveler, I thought, oh, he was stuck in Peru. <laughs> what a nice place to be stuck. Be in. stuck, <laughs> Mar marooned, marooned in Peru. <laughs> you know, uh, talking about Machu Picchu. Um, brings back a memory that I have of doing a, a, a radio piece. I was a producer and I was producing um, a, a summer show about travel, which was sort of weird because at that point, this is 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I don't know. Um, I wasn't doing a lot of traveling. And so, you know, I was not the natural choice to produce it. But once I got into it and realized that we would we would use the radio program as a way of vicarious travel for people right. we would try right. to create the experience but but i also had a panel discussion with um our beloved graham gibson yeah and um elizabeth may and ronald wright so oh yeah ron uh, wrote about peru uh cut stones and yeah. Something. Yeah. Back in the day. That's a long lead up to the question that I had posed to them. And this was, as I say, a long time ago. Are there places in the world we should not go? That yeah. we, yes, that we as human beings should just bloody well leave alone, stay away. And 
Ron told stories about how Machu Picchu, because of the tourism and people lighting fires, walls were crumbling. They, we were destroying yeah, this place. Absolutely. The Galapagos, people come with little spores on their pant legs and then they have invasive I species. I know. So are there places we should not go? Yeah, the Amazon. I mean, it, they, there are place, there are peoples in the Amazon who have never had contact outside of their own cultures. We should just leave it alone, you know, stop meddling in everything, right? Yeah, I would say that. And, and I think, you know, when I see, I mean, even if you go to some of the big sites, um, you know, the countries where these sites are, these historical pieces, have to really work hard to keep tourists from, you know, doing exactly what you're saying, throwing things, bringing things that, you know, um, will harm the environment or will harm the fauna or the flora or whatever, right? I mean, Venice, good God, you know, Venice. I was there one time in Venice and a cruise ship came up to San Marco Square. It was like a 10-story building in front of the square. It was, it was obscene, you know. And so I think they've actually banned them now. So, you know, there are places where you just think, just leave it alone. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, and, and, and uh, Airbnbs have... Um, really affected Barcelona and um, people uh, yeah. who work there have a hard time finding, finding place places to live, to right? live yeah. because, yeah. 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 Well, we're moving, um, we're moving so much around the world these days, right? In a way that we, even, even 10 years ago, we weren't doing this much, right? It's, it's really, I mean, not today. No. <laughs> now we're back to zero, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That people are just, whirling around the world now in a way that they just never did before, right? Yeah. Deborah Windsor says, oh, hey, Deborah. To be <laughs> oh, to be stuck in Paris. <laughs> so if anybody wants to leave Deborah Windsor in Paris, she would happily go along with it. C'est pour moi, she says. Um, but if you were to be stuck somewhere marooned, where would you like it to be? Where would I like to be marooned? Well, I think I could be marooned in, mm, well, Italy is, of course, difficult not to be, not to want to be marooned in Italy. Uh, but it's a familiar place, but it's just, you could never, you know, you could spend your whole life just wandering through Rome and see something new every day. So, um, but I, yeah, I think if I'm choosing a familiar, that would be it. Is, uh, you, is your heritage um, Northern Italian or Southern Italian? I have, a, I have a, a double heritage. Well, I was born in Trieste, so definitely Northern Italian. Right, up in the corner. Udine, yeah, way yeah. up north, almost Yugoslavia, yeah. on the border of Yugoslavia, yeah. It, it's, uh, where, it's where Carl Jung and... Yes. That famous meeting with the three Carl Jung, whoever. And whoever, yeah, up in that, in that, yeah. And, and, and a play was written about that, I think. And famous writers all there. James Joyce. Yeah, was there. James Joyce, that's right. There's a James Joyce Hotel in Trieste, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was born in Trieste, but, um, but my father's from Udine, which is nearby, very close. And uh, my mother, though, is from um, the south of Italy. From Lecce, so they the two of them, you know. So I've sort of crisscrossed the country constantly because I have relatives everywhere, and I have lots of relatives in Rome as well, in Verona, and you know everybody is spread around. So, um, you know, am I from one part or the other? Uh, you know, I, my father in one and my mother in the other. So I'm in a little bit of everything, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to carry on with questions because we've got about 15 minutes left. And as long as people are asking, I'm going to try to get them in. Um, with a collection comprised of interwoven stories, how did you decide when the book was complete? 
uh, did you have to, did you have more stories or themes that didn't make it into the book that, that some just didn't fit? Didn't fit. Um, yes, definitely. I had several stories that have never fit in any book. <laughs> And sometimes that happens because uh, essentially what, you, what I'm concerned with for a period of time, I no longer am concerned with after a while. And so those stories don't fit anymore. So, so yeah, it was definitely a choice. And then um, it was a choice. I knew when the ending was, I knew when I'd written the last story. So, um, and actually I should say, I, 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 the reason I knew that I'd written the last story was that I wrote the last story last. So it brought the, it brought it back to sort of the beginning, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. It, it, mm -hmm. One of the first characters came back in that story. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, so I, I almost wrote the, the last story. I would say that's a story that I did write at the end of when I had all the rest of them together. Then that was one that I, brought them all back together, the people together in that last story. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, though, when I'm when I'm writing, uh, and I would say this just about stories in themselves, within a story, I, I don't necessarily write in, in, um, in sequence. And so I'll be writing things, but I know exactly when I've written the last paragraph or the last line. I go, oh, that's the last line. And then I go back and work elsewhere. So, yeah. <clears throat> And it's the last line because it works rhythmically. It it just has that satisfying yeah. boom that last. Yeah, yeah. It says it, 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 yeah. Whatever it is, you sort of know. You just know somehow. Yeah, it's magic, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what we used to do with magician type people. Um, Burn them uh, at the stake. <laughs> What I think I'll do now is um, just give you a couple of names. You probably can see the list um, that I can see. These are people who've said hi or, or made comments. So Linda Knowles and uh, Tiana Kierkegaard and Sandra Kierkegaard and Shelley. Uh, well, Shelley is our host to this evening, Deborah Windsor, Alma Lee, uh, Linda Rosardo, um, Sandra Gullen is saying hello from Hi, probably. Sandra. Um, so you've got yeah, great friends and fans and readers <laughs> all over the world. And uh, this is a, a wonderful celebration. And I, I highly recommend people grab a copy um, and and get one of those book plates so Jenny can uh, sign it. <laughs> I'm so looking thank you. List. Yeah, I'm looking at the list. You know, I've done a whole bunch of Zoom events, and and one of the features I do like about Zoom is that you can invite people to join that's so right that, and they can say things right yeah 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 and you can see them you can um, actually see them which is kind of great yeah yeah but thank you so. everyone for coming and and uh being here i wish we could do the launch physically which is always nice to you know raise a glass of wine and uh do all that but this is the next best thing right now and we just have to do what we do right you got it <laughs> all right, all right. well that's it. Um, we're done. I hope the button is still there to, to buy books. And um, oh, There's Ashley. here we go. We can turn it. I can turn it over to Ashley. We leave it to Hi. Ashley. Um, so I just want to mention our giveaway that we're doing. So you can win a copy of Permanent Tourists. All you need to do is like the Signature Editions Facebook page and name a country that Jenny has written about in the comments. So uh, name one of those countries. She's written about <laughs> several. Um, and you could win a copy of Permanent Tourists uh, for either you to read or for you to gift to someone else so that they can enjoy it as well. Uh, so we'll let people do that. Um, and okay. thank, thank you so much for uh, joining us for this wonderful event. Mm -hmm. It was 
uh, lovely to be able to talk about and celebrate permanent tourists. It's a little bit different than normal, but it means that we can have people from all over the world uh, joining us and watching these events. That's always just a little nice feature about this. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to Hal for being our wonderful host this evening. Yes, and thank you thank to. You. Thank you to Jenny for, um, for, for writing such a fantastic book and for uh, answering so many wonderful questions. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. This was lovely. And I want to thank Signature Editions for publishing the book and doing all the wonderful editing and, and for everything. And yep. thank you. To Lovely. So if you haven't already, the, the link to purchase the book is in the comments and in the description of the live stream. Um, again, if you purchase your book from Massey Books, which is where that link takes you to, uh, you'll get one of those signed book plates. They're very beautiful, actually. I've seen pictures of them. Um, and so be sure to do that or support your local independent bookstore, whatever that may be. I'm sure you will all have a favorite one. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll announce who the winner is um, after the live stream. We'll contact the, the lucky winner um, and let them know that they've won a copy of Permanent Tourists and get their contact information so we can send that out to them. Um, uh, the entries are pouring in. Yeah, so. I can see them popping up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much to everyone um, okay. and have a wonderful evening. You got okay. it. Bye, Jenny. Bye. Bye. Thank you all.